Hey, everybody. We'll get started. When, uh, when Rob and I started planning this session, uh, I don't know, like eight months ago, whenever you have to put in your uh, proposals for lectures, we were going to split this session into about half how we got our whole faculty credentialed in TE and half some of the some cool images in show and tell. But uh, since, we've, since we've written this, our use of TE has kind of exploded. I've done a lot more of it than we did at the time, so we decided to kind of stay away from the credentialing stuff and just kind of look at some cool images and how we're using TE right now. Uh, so if you have any questions about like how we did the credentialing parts and stuff like that, we're going to spend much less time on that. Just email me and Rob and we will uh, we'll get back to you and, and fill you in on that part. But And so that's all I'm going to say. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to Rob here and we're going to go from there. So. Uh... So there's 50 slides here, and we're going to do it in 20 minutes. So this should be interesting. Um, if anybody has any questions, please ask. Uh, it'd be more fun if there were questions along the way. Um, so we got a TE probe about, we first got one in 2013 with a big purchase of a bunch of ultrasound machines. We just kind of tucked a TE probe into the purchase agreement, and nobody noticed that we got it. And then. Jim actually came up with this great idea, and this is the cutting edge part of this lecture. It's not, TE really isn't cutting edge. It's been around for a long, long time. Um, it just hasn't been used properly, in my view, in the last 30 years. Um, the, the cutting edge thing is that all emergency physicians should be credentialed in using this, um, and hopefully I can convince you of that by the end of this uh, 20 minutes. So it's easier than TTE. Having done thousands and thousands of TTEs, um, when I started doing transesophageal, it was like, this is so easy, it's ridiculous. And so the people that should be the most interested in this should be the people who are really bad at TTE, not the experts. <laughs> so in, the, uh, in previous studies and groups that have learned this, it's really the experts who did it and not the other people, which is backwards. And the other thing it allows you to do is continuous hands-free monitoring or imaging. So you don't need to keep putting the probe back on the person over and over and over again every time they change. So it's perfect for like a near arrest situation where things are changing rapidly and you just want to put the probe down and watch the heart continuously. So here's an example. This guy's getting a central line. He's all covered up. We're watching his heart continuously because once you put it down, you don't need to touch it. And then this happens. Now you could argue, well, you, should, you would notice on the monitor that he got bradycardic, but you've all been in this situation and you don't, right? When this thing's on, right in your face and it's a video, you know, the medical students stand there and will go, whoa, 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 the guy's heart's not beating anymore. Um, and that's exactly what we find. And I'll show you some pictures later. We, we project these up to 70 inch screen, which makes it even more obvious. Everybody within 30 or 40 feet realizes this person's in trouble. Like, give this guy some epi or something. Um, so here's the epi going in. So this guy never needed CPR because we picked this up immediately the on the first beat. And then within a few minutes after that, he's back. So this was just a septic patient who was getting a line. He probably would have gotten CPR a couple minutes later when we realized he was dead under the, under the uh, sheet. Uh, but that didn't have to happen because he was, this is, I would argue, the best monitoring you can get. So, like I said, you can do continuous monitoring. That's probably the biggest benefit of that. And, and people who say, well, you, I do transthoracic and I'm fine with that, you cannot do continuous monitoring for two hours with that. And you can set up a system like we have where you can actually monitor the entire two hours if you want. And so we have, we have recording. When we put the TE probe in, we have the ability to record for the entire two hours if we want to. Um, the other thing is you can do this with chest compressions ongoing during defibrillation, during procedures, as I just showed you. And so um, it really helps in, in a lot of different ways. Nobody, uh, nobody's really used it like this in the past. Maybe in the OR you could say they use it like this. But if you go to a cardiologist and say, can you train me to do this? Um, and how many have you done in a cardiac arrest situation? They'll say, uh, none. Um, and if they do say, I've done this in cardiac arrest, ask them to show you the images, because they're lying. Um, <laughs> So, so this is an old movie, right? Any of you ever seen this movie? Where they, he sits in the chair and they can watch his heart up on the screen. And how old is this movie? It's pretty old, right? 
It's not as old as the studies that show that TEE works really well in arrest situations. 1993, are you kidding me? There's not just one of them either. There's a whole bunch of them. And not just in cardiac arrest situations. You know, in the OR and the ICU, you, know, you can look these up and, and they're really there. They're really real. And this, so I would argue that emergency medicine doesn't have to reprove all this crap. It's already been proven. It's already been used other areas. Every specialty that uses a certain tool doesn't have to go out and reprove that it works. So I would argue this is, this is proven. Just look this stuff up. It's so old it's hard to find on a literature search. You have to set your dates all the way back to 1950. Um, and in the, in the ICU setting, it's used extensively. The only difference between Echolab and us is Echolab doesn't use it when people's uh, conditions are rapidly changing. You have to make an appointment, and then you get a TEE. And you have to be stable to get one. Uh, and the way we use it is, you know, you have to be in cardiac arrest or really unstable. So I think this is actually the most appropriate, the more appropriate use of this modality than cardiology uses it for. So barriers to its use are, who the heck's going to teach us? And it's a natural reaction to go to a cardiologist and say, hey, can you teach me how to do this? Um, I naturally want to argue with people. So my natural reaction when the, when the cardiologist told us that they want to get involved in credentialing us was, well, how many have you done in, in a cardiac arrest? And they said, well, we really don't do them like that. I'm like, okay, we're done then. I'll learn to do them in a cardiac arrest, and you do them in the echo lab or whatever, wherever you do them. I don't even know. Um, but I know it's not in cardiac arrest. Um, and it's not in really sick patients in the middle of the night. Um, so, so people think this is an advanced skill. It's really not. If you can push something down someone's throat, which we all do thousands of times in our career, um, you can do this. It's not hard. Um, so lack of equipment is a problem, the expensive equipment. So I think when, when you look at the equipment and it's $30,000 uh, a probe, your reaction shouldn't be, oh, that's too expensive. I could never do that. Your reaction should be, how the hell do I get these companies to charge me less? Because um, I need a bunch of these things, not just one. Um, <laughs> And it's like any other piece of equipment. The monitor on the wall in the emergency department, does anyone know how much those cost? They're like 30, 40,000 bucks each. When was the last time you saved someone's life with a monitor on the wall? When was the last time someone had a cardiac arrest in your department and the monitor, they're all dinging so no one noticed? They're in every single room and nobody ever questions them. Nobody asks for evidence for a monitor, but yet 30 or 40,000 bucks, no big deal. So I, would, I think I would question, like, hey, we spend a lot more money on dumb things. Why don't we spend it on, spend it on some smart things? And the idea that it's difficult to learn is completely untrue. It's actually really easy to learn. We have one of these simulators. And I would argue there's not many. I love doing procedures. And I'm, I kind of don't like simulators in general, because I like doing procedures on real people. Um, but I. I would say that of all the procedures you ever learn, this one can be learned completely on a simulator. And Rob Artfield in Canada showed that. And it's, we did the same thing that he did, his four-hour course on a simulator, and just said, and the cardiologists were like, well, who, you're not going to practice on live patients? I'm like, no, we're going to practice on a simulator. And it's worked out fine. Keep in mind that the same company makes flight simulators. So this isn't like flying an airplane where if you you know, if it doesn't work out, you're going to all die. This is, if, you, if it doesn't work out and you don't get an image, you wouldn't have had that image anyway. You're not going to hurt the person by doing a TEE. So uh, Rob uh, Arnfield did this study where he, he trained 12 of his people. He trained the experts, which kind of makes sense because no one's ever done this before. And then he proved that the next 100 they did over the next year, they did really well. And they actually, it actually helped out a lot. Um, so these publications have been out there for a few years, and we read these and just said, you know, we can do that, and, and with the idea that we don't need to all be ultrasound experts at the baseline to do this. We all do ultrasound every day anyway. And then, um, so we did this four-hour course. Um, everybody had baseline experience, and this is why emergency physicians can do this. You already know how to run the machine. You already know how to do transthoracic. You're just looking at the heart from the other direction, really, it's sort of the opposite direction. If you turn all your TTE images upside down, they look like TEE images. And it's not hard to go from one to the other. Um, the crazy thing is anesthesiologists do this, do TEE. 
but ask an anesthesiologist to show you a transthoracic image. They'll just go, uh, no, no thanks. They don't do that. So that's how crazy this is. We think of this as a really high level skill where anesthesiologists all do it and they can't do anything with transthoracic. They couldn't even find your heart, believe me. So, so you guys should like pick this up and run with it. Um, you also do procedures that are much more complicated, thoracotomies, you know, endoscopy. Um, think of all the procedures you do. This is simple, pushing something down someone's throat. The, one of the cardiologist complaints when we started doing this was they thought we were gonna ha make someone aspirate. And I'm like, we're gonna do it on intubated patients, you know. Oh, really, okay. Um, and, I, and I'm like, you know, if someone was gonna make someone aspirate, we would be the last people to do it. You know, give me a break. Um, <laughs> so, and, and we had one case where a two, an ET tube got dislodged while the TE probe was going in. So what do you think happened? Well, the same person who just intubated the patient was putting the TE probe in, so they just went, oh, crap, put that back in, and I'll put the TE probe back in. If that would ha I would argue if that happened in any other setting, it would be a huge problem, because the person who intubated isn't there anymore, probably. And if the tube got dislodged, it would be a disaster. In our hands, it's not a disaster. It's just like, oh, no big deal. So another reason we should be doing this, not somebody else. The tube is about, the uh, probe is about the size of an Ewald tube, which we've all put down hundreds and hundreds of times. No big deal. And also you have a baseline, like I said, based on familiarity with the machine already. Um, we're also more experienced with other transducers than anybody else. These are all the transducers we have in our emergency department. We know how to use all the other ones. The only one we didn't use was transesophageal, which is crazy. So if we can use all these other ones, you know, like I said, the people that classically or traditionally do TE don't know how to use any of these other probes. So we should pick up the last one here and start using it more. We started off with one of these, and that now we have six, um, six probes that go on the machines that hang right over our, um, our uh, resuscitation bays. And the reason for six is that we got one, and then it was dirty when we wanted to use it, and then we got two, and then I would come on for a weekend, and I, the first thing I'd hear is, oh, the, both the probes are dirty, and they're not gonna get clean until Monday morning. And so we kept lobbying for more and more and more, and then we had cases, it's easy to present cases where like, it would have really helped in this case, but it wasn't available. So once you start, it's pretty easy to make the argument that if we find utility in this thing, it needs to be there all the time, we need a bunch of probes. People think they're gonna do some damage with the uh, TE probe, doesn't pan out in studies. These are gigantic studies, and look at the numbers here, 7,200, 10,000 patients, and look at the numbers on the left. This is esophageal or gastric perforation. When there's papers out there that say the complication rate is high, they're talking about little lacerations in the mouth. And we're talking about saving people in cardiac arrest and near cardiac arrest. The, the real complications are here and they just don't pan out to be a problem. Here's the standard views that we do, just four of them. And the, the real trick is just to realize that when the probe comes down past the heart in the mid-esophagus, it's kind of looking at the heart, if you look at this spot right here, it's looking at the heart kind of the opposite of an apical view. And so, and then as it comes around the back of the heart, you, with the same probe angle, you can get a short axis view, which is pretty cool. So if you just simply push the thing down the patient's throat with this transducer facing the ceiling or their feet, um, you're gonna get great images in most cases. So that's kind of how it goes in. You don't have to move, these knobs on the probe are, the big knobs on the top there, move the probe around like a bronchoscope. You don't need to do that. You can do the electronic steering, which is shown up there on the upper right, um, by just hitting the button. It doesn't move anything on the probe. So if you're worried about screwing up the esophagus, don't even move the probe, which we can do in almost every single case. Just rotate electronically so here's the first image you get when you push it down someone's throat, um, typically. And so it's a four chamber view, it's the opposite of what you would see from an apical view, just upside down. And it's really easy to judge the uh, function of the left ventricle in general. 
And the other thing is you're really close to the valves, so you get a really good image of the valves. Here's someone with a PE. You can see the right ventricle, which is on the, on the left, is bulging much bigger than the left, and the left is very small and hyperdynamic. Here's a bad left ventricle. And you can pretty easily tell which wall is which there. Here's someone who's in cardiac arrest and not coming back because they have basically standstill. So you can see this is PEA. You can see it beat once in a while. You can see so, a tiny amount of contractility uh, or movement with each beat, but it's not doing anything. Here's another one. There's some studies from, there's a, a study from Germany that shows that it's really important to see vi fine V-fib and recognize it. It's really easy with this to find fine V-fib. This is the first person I ever put it down. It was a, a cardiac arrest. And as soon as I put it in, I was like, holy crap, I didn't see that clot with TTE. I had looked a bunch of TTE. And I, it just makes me wonder how many of those we've, codes we've worked for a long time. And it didn't feel like I should work this for much longer with a big clot in the LV. And it pans out that, that this is what you see kind of at the end of a code when someone's been coded for like an hour. No movement at all. It's really easy. So if you push it down uh, the esophagus to the, uh, into the stomach, you get this short axis view. It's, again, really easy to figure out what's going on. There's the right ventricle over there. There's a the septum. It's easy to see the septum's not moving here. The rest of the heart is, kind of. Um, but it's not, it's not hard if you're used to doing TTEs. It's not hard to tell what's what when you do this. Here's a hyperdynamic heart with a pretty big RV for how hyperdynamic uh, the left side is. Again, not hard to figure out what you're looking at. Really bad heart. Someone getting CPR. So you can adjust, the, we sometimes adjust the Lucas device around the chest based on what the echo, what the TE looks at or looks like. Like I said, you can see the valves really well um, if you electronically steer um, a little bit. And you can make judgments about what the, you know, a lot of times when we're doing TTE, we don't put color on because our images are so crappy, color really doesn't help. It always helps uh, with this. You can easily see if there's a, a valvular problem. It's really easy to see them open for one thing, and then the color flow back through the valve is super easy. As in this case, this guy has a little dissection right here and dissecting through the valve, and he's hemodynamically unstable. It's, it would be hard to see all this with transthoracic, depending on the guy's size, but he was, this is a big guy. So really, truly helpful. I mean, it tells you why the guy's unstable. Here's a dissection. Like, where the cardiothoracic surgeon came and the cardiologist came and said, I've never seen anything like that. And, and this is also incompatible with life. The cardiology department wanted to, um, the head of our cardiology department wanted to publish this. And I think someone in our department is publishing it, but I'm like, you can't publish stuff that we do. Um, so, um, so the last view here is the bicaval view, um, and this is just a wire. This just shows a, someone putting in an IJ while we're doing a TE, and it's so obvious where the wire is coming down. The, the SVC is there, it's to the right, and the wire is coming down it. And so you can basically make sure that all of your central lines are always in the right place because you're going to see the wire come through that area every time. And if it doesn't come through that area, you're not in the central circulation. Here's one that's done during cardiac arrest. You can see the wire right up here, the reflection of the wire. And this is especially helpful when you're uh, putting someone on ECMO in cardiac arrest. And you can see here's the head of, this is the IVC is going to the left there, the SVC goes up that way, but you can see the end of the ECMO catheter. And that's exactly where you want the venous one, is right there, the tip right in the right atrium. And I just showed you, I'm, I just have this here to show you our, the big screen that we have behind all these, our machines and our resuscitation bits. We have these 70 inch screens. And this might seem like, wow, this is really high tech, but the machine there, this is like a $50,000 machine. The probe is $50,000. And then that TV is like 800 bucks at Best Buy. <laughs> so if you have, <laughs> if you've invested in all this expensive stuff, go to Best Buy and get the cheap part of it that looks cool. <laughs>
And it really does help when you're running a resuscitation to project it up there because everyone in the room can see it. It's right in your face, and it's really obvious what's going on with the patient's heart. So hopefully I've convinced you a little bit that this is something you should look into. It's easy to learn. It's very safe. The only people who will tell you it's not safe are people who don't want you to do it for whatever reason. And people who aren't really into ultrasound should be the most excited about this because it doesn't require as much skill as, as trans thoracic echo. When that movie, The Matrix, came out, I was, uh, I was a resident. And I remember talking to Rob saying, because you know, the whole time, the only monitor they have on the people when they go in The Matrix is their heart beating from a TE image. It's like 20 years ago. I'm like, God, if we had a monitor like that, we could take care of so much better care of people than we do now. We finally got there, but uh, it's a 23-year haul. But uh, honestly, this has revolutionized our care. We, we didn't actually realize how useful it would be. We kind of thought we'd adjust the Lucas device with it, and that would be what, what it would be for. And it's, uh, it's actually been much more effective and easy to do uh, than, it's, uh, than we even thought. Even the surgeons during trauma, bad traumas, they'll say, I can't feel the pulse very well. Could you put the TE probe down and show me what his heart's doing? I, like, I had a cardiologist wow, ask me to put it in the other day the so corner. I could get the images for him because he wanted to see what was going on. Yeah. When that starts happening, you know this <laughs> is this is the real deal. So, any questions? I've done it several times while I was hanging onto it, and it's well insulated, I guess. <laughs> well, Actually, out, right? the first time I did it, I, I said, well, I might fall down and wet my pants, but um, I was like ready for a, a shock, but it never happened. Um, you know, I don't know what the, what, the, what the companies say officially. I know several people who have tried it. No, I, I don't know of any problem that's, you know, anyone that's destroyed a probe. I think it's because the probes are so expensive. People are a little paranoid about them. Yeah. 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 They actually do an electrical test between every time they clean it. I actually just discovered this because they were doing it wrong at our place. They when they bring it to central supply before they clean it, they put it in a, a water bath and they run a, they they run electricity into it and make sure it doesn't come out the other end. So they're pretty well insulated. And eventually we'll need emergency medicine specific probes. And it seems like if you've got that, then you'd put electrodes on it and we'd be shocking off the, you know, because you could really place it pretty nice and use as little energy as possible that way to protect the heart. We've shocked and we haven't had a problem, but uh, I, 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 haven't, I don't even know what the recommendations are. You know, that being said, I blew up an end tidal CO2 monitor once when I was first studying those because the water condensed up the line and we shocked somebody and it fried it and exploded. So, I, and that was supposed to be safe. So. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see how many times we've done it and, and get that out oh, there. Look, we had it's, it's, it's probably dozens, though.
Um, you know, you've probably noticed, like, right after you shock, it's hard to come back really slowly. Mostly, most of my experience not doing compressions is with hypothermic patients because I don't feel like, you know, they're really cold. I don't feel like I need to anyway. And they'll, it'll come back. I have some good videos of right after the shock, and it'll just, it'll take like 10 seconds for it to really contract well. You can tell it's in, not in fib anymore, um, but they'll come back really slowly. So, Don't really need the pulse check. Yeah, I think I would probably do it just watching what happens in the hypothermic patients. I'd probably do it for 15, 30 seconds and give the heart, you know, takes, seems it, at least in hypothermic patients, it seems to take a little while for it to, to really have a real contraction. Probably catching, probably catching re-arrest is um, early. You know, you have all these monitors on people, and like that guy that was under the sheet, you know, people who are, were in cardiac arrest who are just really close to coding, um, or you can't feel their pulse very well um, right when they arrive, and everybody's wondering, should we do CPR or not? Um, it's really helpful in that. You know, if you, if you see good contractility, you know, a lot of people that, well, we know with transthoracic that a lot of people who have poor pulse palpation or inability to palpate the pulse are just really hyperdynamic. And certainly if someone's hyperdynamic. And it's also been helpful diagnostically. So like we see the right heart's big right away. We see a clot in the yeah. ventricle right away. We give an intervention and see that it made a difference or didn't make a difference. We don't have to wait two, three minutes to check a pulse check to see if the epi did anything. We just look and that's not doing anything or it is. That's kind of been the bigger change is we can really tell what we're doing. That, so we knew it would be useful in arrest for assessing your CPR, but it's the post-arrest where it's really been helpful, so we can titrate our therapies. Uh, we don't really have a rule about when to use it. it if a patient's intubated, we can use it. Um, when, we, when we went through the credentials committee, um, it was written as ca cardiac arrest only, and I, we, changed it, yeah, we changed it to peri-arrest and near-arrest, really vague things like that. Near-arrest sounds scary enough to, to cardiologists that they're like, well, near-arrest sounds reasonable. The short um, version of credentialing, though, is that we did not ask cardiology for permission. In fact, we refused to let them give us permission to do this because we said RT has nothing to do with your TEE. We're not doing, we're doing, a, we're, this is a, mo a modality to assist us in peri-arrest patients. This is not an echo and it has nothing to do with you and you guys don't do it so we don't want your permission. Um, and that was so they can't mess with us or take their permission away or play games with us. We, we learned the hard way 20 years ago with the FAST exam, that once somebody gave you permission, they can take it away. And radiology used us against that for 20 years. We kind of broke out of that yoke, and we weren't going to start all over again with a new department. And you can ask, you know, like I said, you can ask them, you know, you must have a, yeah, you can really help me. You must have a catalog or a, a, a bunch of cases of cardiac arrest with TEE in, right? And when they say, no, we don't have any, then say, well, oh, we'll just get an outside emergency medicine expert. We had Rob Arnfield come once and, and uh, with our first course and, and uh, kind of show us the way that he taught it. And so and then we, after that, we just, everybody that gets credential just goes through that same thing. And we so, require every physician in our department to get credential just so it's not a, a weird thing that you, just, you have to use it to work in our department now. Um, and the cardiologists, now that, now that they understand what we do has nothing to do with them, now they're very supportive. And they're really mad at us a year ago, and now they're fine because they realize it's not affecting the number of echoes they do. We're not interpreting it like this is a 16% EF, and we're not reading it that way. Uh, and they like the data um, a lot. And when someone gets put on ECMO now, they ask, just in the last couple weeks, they've asked twice, can we keep the probe in and we'll bring it back to you later? And we're like, sure, I guess. I think uh, we have to yeah. show them how to use it too and what they're looking for, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it helps to have a machine, if, even if you're using it on a mounted machine, it helps to have a cart-based machine that it can hook up to 
So when they do ask, you can say, sure, roll this up there and, and uh, bring it back when you're done. So, yeah. Uh, I think, yes. And the reimbursement is much larger than a TTE. So I imagine it, they're expensive, but I imagine they'll pay for themselves pretty easily. We've been able to prove a positive ROI for capital expenses when we buy more probes. A chest x-ray before you put the probe in? How many pairs do you have done? We've done a couple hundred now. And uh, we just last April was when we got everybody credentialed. Jim actually is the chair, and he said you can't work here unless you credential at TE. And that's really the big breakthrough. Everyone was like, even people who didn't want to do it were like, OK, I guess I'll do it. Um, <laughs> I want to keep my job. No complications that we know of. And uh, there were a couple pe couple of people we couldn't get it, one I couldn't get it down. Um, I actually used a video laryngoscopy to show that there was a stenosis right at the proximal esophagus. And I pushed a small OG tube down it, but I could not get, I could watch it push up against the stenosis. I couldn't get it through. And then there was one where it, it we don't have video evidence, but kind of the same thing happened. So. Yeah, there's, if you look in that uh, paper that I showed um, about the complications, it, the same paper, um, oh, gotta go back to it. There's a, there's a good publication out there that shows um, people you shouldn't, shouldn't put it in. So contraindications, relative contraindications and pretty, pretty, uh, they're pretty well described. Of course, the history on most of our rest patients, right, is found down, don't have yeah, any bottom. So you're not, you're probably not going to know. Basically, if you, if you start putting it down and it's really hard to push down, you'll probably stop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Some people like to stand at the side of the patient. Some people like to stand at the head. I like to stand at the side. So I would do bronchoscopy. Kind and of once we get it in place, way. we have like a holder so we can let go of it. Ours is hanging over the bed, mounted, so. Yeah, we put our machine, our machine hangs uh, with our monitors over the patient bed. They're, they're, they're mounted over the bed. They're mounted on each bed in our resuscitation area. But I don't think it's so important where the machine is, as long as, you know, I would aim it at the people taking care of the patient, so the more of them can see it, the better. And we project it up on the screen. And we're way over, and we don't want to keep anybody from the reception, so we'll hang around up here to answer questions. But yeah, uh, if you have more questions, <laughs> come on up.